Oh, now we're going to go. Now we're being professional. Thanks. You're listening to the dollop on the all things comedy network. Now the way this works is oh, God. each week. I Dave Anthony read a story from American history. Oh, nice. Look at to that. my boo. Oh boy. Wow. Reddit's gotten you. <laughs> Gareth Reynolds, who has no idea what the topic is going to be about. Um, we usually don't do anything like this. As a matter of fact, I always tell people, because we get a lot of people saying requests. Can you say this at a live show? Can you do this at a show? Can you say this on a show? And, but this one I got, and I was like, all right, I'm going to do this one. We're never going to do another request. Okay. This is the only one. But this one's important. We have a message for a special fan from someone in their life. Hey, Audrey. 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 Aside from being a superhero nerd and a podcast connoisseur, you have been an incredible girlfriend. Thank you for always being there to make me laugh, smile, and to go on all these crazy adventures with me. You always go the extra mile to do special things for me, and I always will want uh, to do the same for you. So I've asked your favorite podcast to ask you something special. Audrey, will you go to the prom with Maya? Go to the prom with Maya. Go! Audrey. Weird. Be weird. Audrey. She said no. She better not. Oh, if she does. Oh, my God. Heads will roll. And called it, quote, his jam pad. Jam pad? I'm the fucking hippo guy. Dave, okay. My name's Gary. <laughs> my name's Gary. Oh. Wait, is it for fun? And this is not going to become the Tiggly Podcast. Okay. This is like anarchy. And a five-part coefficient. <laughs> my room is playing. Now hit him with the puppy. You both present sick arguments. <laughs> no sleep tell hippo. No sleep tell hippo. That action part. Hi, Gary. No. I sleep done, my friend. No. <laughs> no. Rhoda. Rhoda in the court. Uh, that's us, the dollop. That's right. That's a pretty on the all good, things. That, and if you would like to watch this mm, podcast, mm -hmm. you can go to the All Things Comedy YouTube page, and um, just have a finger around. What finger around, and you'll find us. Just don't have a, have a finger. Um, don't ever say I that. I will be going on a big tour this summer. Uh, in June. Uh, the 6th or the 8th, I will be at Good Nights Comedy Club in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'll be at the Vermont Comedy Club in Burlington, Vermont, the 13th through the 15th of June, the 20th through the 22nd of June. I'll be at the Comedy Attic in Bloomington, Illinois, Indiana. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Dave, shut up. Uh, I'll be at Comedy Off-Broadway in Lex Lexington, Kentucky, the 27th <laughs> through the 29th of June. I'll be at Laughs Boston, the 19th oh. and the 20th <laughs> in July. Mm. August dates, 9th through the 11th, I'll be at the Improv in Denver, Colorado. I'll be at the Fremont Abbey in Seattle, Washington, oh. just the evening of the 17th. And then uh, Comedy on State Street in Madison, Wisconsin, I will be recording an album, and I'll be there that whole weekend from the 22nd to the 24th. Four. So great. Yeah, but it's you're, so great. You're hamming it I up. I love it. No, I yeah, love it. I love what's going on. Fake laughter and uh Gareth Squarespace. Ah Squarespace is where we keep all of our uh secrets our, hidden. Our, our web uh of lies things. and secrets. Uh Squarespace is of course a, a uh a website uh, company you can build your beautiful website on. Um we have our dollop sources on Squarespace. You have your personal web page on Squarespace, and I yep. have my personal web page on Squarespace. So clearly, we like it. Um, I personally chose it because I like uh, the templates. Um, super easy to use. Um, yeah, it's a good. It's a good company. Get a website already, yeah. assholes. Yeah, well, that's not cool. Oh, um, Squarespace. Uh, uh, beautiful templates, like I said, created by world class designers. Powerful e-commerce functionality lets you sell anything online. Anything? Uh, anything. Well, within legal. Uh, oh, yeah. that's okay. Uh, a new way to buy domains and choose from over 200 extensions. Built-in search engine optimization. Free and secure hosting 24-7. Award-winning support. I'm telling you. Squarespace. It's the way to go. So head over uh, to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch. For free you, child? Child. Uh, head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And okay. when you're ready... Uh, to launch, use the offer code DOLLOP to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com. Enter code DOLLOP. Boom. You like that? I love it, baby. You're my good boy. Yeah, I'm a good baby. You're <laughs> I want this free child, though. We also bought to you by stamps.com. No one really has time to go to the post office. You're busy. 
You got to go through traffic. There's parking. And there's also the line your... at the post office, which is full of uh, yeah, misfits. Yeah. Well, no, you can't say that. Oh. <laughs> Damn it. Shit. <laughs> Uh, no one really has time to go to the post office. Uh, you're busy. Who's got time for all that traffic parking, lugging your mail? And pack? Why? Just have the post office. And guy if you go in there, it's you. fine. It's fine. Yeah. It, it's Sheila, she works there. She's nice. I miss her because now I do uh, stamps.com. Right. Um, Stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer, whether you're a small office sending invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day. Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. With Stamps.com, you get five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. Not to mention, it's a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters. Stamps.com is a no-brainer, saving you time and money. It's no one over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. I do. I want to mail out all the business from the podcast. Sure. And, and it's saved me tons of time, and it's super easy, and I love it. And I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, and we're all happy. I'm happy. So right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in dollop. That's stamps.com. Enter dollop. Mm. 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 Um, Gareth, we are also brought to you by Joybird. Joybird. Couches, furniture. Great couches. Great. I mean, we quality. Are, yeah, stuff. I, mean, I think we're both pretty happy with Joybird. Uh, why well, go? We got a big chair that I can now sit in with two dogs, um, and uh, and it's awesome. Uh, my wife likes Joybird so much that after we got the Joybird chair, she ended up getting Joybird for her office. Hmm. Yeah, that's how much she enjoyed it. And they helped her out. Like she had a like a person, I don't right. know, concierge or whatever you call it. Like there's a person a on concierge. there, a personal person that helps her out. Yeah, a personal um, person. So uh, I highly recommend it. With Joybird, you get one-of-a-kind furniture made to your unique taste. Turn on, uh, turn on, mm. turn your ideas into reality with hundreds of styles and options. From mid-century modern to contemporary classics, customizable in an array of fabric choices uh, from rich buttery leather, I know you like butter, mm. and plush velvets to every color imaginable. Free personal design consultants to help nail down your perfect design. So it's not a concierge, but it, uh, a consultant. A consultant. It's a, it's a person that helps right. you out. Quality handcrafted furniture, 365 day home trial, skip the furniture store and bring the showroom home. Sit on it, sleep on it, and break it in. <laughs> Long pause there, everybody. Let's not break the stuff. <laughs> if you don't love your Joybird, return for a full refund. I'm sorry. I broke it. And <laughs> when does my money come back? Uh, see how Joybird is revolutionizing online furniture shopping. Create the furniture that brings you joy today at joybird.com slash dollop. Go to joybird.com slash dollop and receive an exclusive offer for 25% off your first order by using code dollop. dollop. How'd you know the code? Gets the show. Um, we are also brought to you by OpenFit, um, which, by the way, I can hook you up with. We They just said we use the same password. Oh, really? Yeah, I forgot okay. to mention that. But oh. I've been using it. I've been doing it. It's actually, they're actually hard workouts. I want there. them. Like, it's legit. I want no them. No joke workouts. You know my old system. It's I know. good. It's weird. <laughs> you do like a grandpa thing at a park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Remember when you like see the Tai Chi people in the park? You're yeah. like, they're crazy. Uh, yeah, that's I'm you. right there with that's them. That's 100%. Right you. next to them jumping. Uh, Open Fit is bringing you something new that makes it even easier to never miss a, a workout. Lose the commute to the gym and let the workouts come to you. So what is it? Open Fit takes all the complexity out of losing weight and getting fit. It's a brand new, super simple streaming service that allows you to work out from the comfort of your home in as little as 10 minutes a day. And, Which is crazy. And those 10 minute workouts are brutal. They have to be. They really are brutal. Um, if you want them to be, there's you know different levels. Um, everyone's bodies are different. Open Fit gets that, which is why it is personalized to your needs with custom tailored original content. They have amazing trainers and classes. Uh, it's super simple. Um, you can work out uh, to your schedule, uh, access anywhere at any time, computer, uh, on a web enabled TV, tablet, smartphone, Roku, you get the deal. Um, you can lose up to 15 pounds in just 30 days. Hmm. It's harder with me because I eat a lot of the fudge. 
Um, fudge eating is not part of the program. It's not on the diet for open fit? No, it's oh, not, that's not, not what, you, what you're supposed to do. Right. Uh, you do open so fridge. I do open fridge. Right. It's different. <laughs> but I've been doing open fit and I have been losing weight. And uh, and it is, legit, like I said, it's a legit workout. There's tons of different um, workouts on there and it's really good. Um, open fit has changed the way I work out. Uh, with our code DOLLOP, you can join me on a fitness journey personalized just for you. Again, use our code DOLLOP and start using open fit for your journey to a healthier life. Mm. Uh, right now, during the Open Fit 30 Day Challenge, our listeners get a special extended 30 day free trial membership to Open Fit where you can lose up to 15 pounds in 30 days when you text DOLLOP to 303030. 30 30. Um, you will get full access to Open Fit, all the workouts and nutrition information totally free. Again, just text DOLLOP to 303030. 303030. 303030. 303030. How many 30s? Three. Okay. It's different. Standard MESA message and data rates may apply. Oh. So, well, that's a that's you, tough. Yeah. That's where it got weird. Yeah. Are people still paying for text messages? Um I know they still have to say that, but who pays for yeah, I guess some people do. I guess some people who do like really, you know, bottom of the barrel plans that can't afford like a good plan, they probably pay for The text. only reason I would do that would be to like limit texting. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I would like to limit text from you, which I did today. Yeah, which you did today, <laughs> all day. I was like, what time? What time? What time? What time? What time? What time? Look at your laugh. This is psycho. We have fun. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Mm. Aaron, we really do. Get the we shot really collar. have fun. Aaron, get the shot collar. January 6, 1925. Ooh. Year of our Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, this is the day of our Lord Jesus. This is the, we're, this is the Easter episode. Yeah. So it better be the year of our Lord. Yeah, this, this is the, the day, day when they Jesus shot him down came. In a plane? No, this is where he comes from behind the rock, and he's like, "You motherfuckers, I'm here." And he everyone come, was like, oh. "Did he push the rock aside? Did he come I think out he pushed through the it. rock?" I think he pushed it. If memory serves, he pushed it. So he's like a strong guy. He's Jesus, dude. He could have walked through it if he wanted to. What? Oh, he could have walked through absolutely. it. Absolutely. He's got that sort of skinny guy rip thing going on. So he on. comes out and he pushes and he's, what the fuck? And all these rabbits come out from behind him. Yeah. And, they, and then he's, yeah. they're like, Jesus, if you want to know where we are, follow the egg trail. And then he yeah. had to pick eggs the whole way. Right. Anyway, that's the dollop story of Jesus. <laughs> John DeLorean was born oh, in Detroit. Shit. Oh, shit. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. His Romanian immigrant father, Zachary, worked as a union organizer at a Ford factory. Did not speak great English, dad, which kept him from moving up. Um, he liked to drink. John DeLorean's father liked yeah. the sauce. Okay. And getting into bar fights. Okay. Well, that's And occasionally uh, punching his wife. Oh, well, now, well, and not super light and fun any longer. No, but God, it took a dark turn. Dark turn. Uh, Catherine was a Hungarian immigrant who worked for GE, and when Zachary got violent, she would leave with the kids. Okay. She started taking them for a long time. Uh, more than once, she stayed a year in California with her sister. Wow. So that's a long... At that point, it feels like it's over. Yeah, pretty much. Right. She finally divorced Zachary in uh, 1942. He moved into a boarding house and became a drug addict, and John never saw his father again. Okay, so he has a fun little ending. Yeah, he had a great. Yeah, time. he had a great. He yeah it browns was a good and then blacks out. Yeah, good run. Right, that's cool. Uh, John grew up uh, lower middle class during the depression. He got into an elite public school, Cass Technical High School. Mmm, Cass Tech. Uh, it was basically a feeder into the three big automakers. Okay. Uh, he seemed set, right? That's a that's everyone was trying to get into it. Like if you got in, then you're gonna make money at the factory. Like you're right. you're killing it. And well, and those are jobs that'll never go overseas. That's right, that's right. Uh, but he also played the saxophone in Ooh. the school jazz band. Ooh, and that's what he decided he would be a musician. Sure. So he got into to cast tech, and then he was like. I'm here for jazz. I like I like I like I'm the here. sax. I'm, I'm here for make em ups. Uh, I just feel it, man. It's in me. Sure, jazz is in me. Yeah. Okay. After Cass, he got a music scholarship to Lawrence Institute of Technology. And then he was like, "I want to make microwaves. <laughs> That's what I want to do." Before he could graduate, he was drafted in oh. 1943. Okay. Uh, he came back three years later. Family was not doing well, so he took different jobs to help them out. Okay. He finally finished his undergraduate degree, a degree and got a job as an insurance salesman. Interesting. He said he did this to learn how to talk to people better. Okay. 
which yeah, that's why you do that. Sure, for sure. Or you can just talk to people, but also, yeah, but also you could just sell them insurance and really right. know how to be a natural conversationalist. <laughs> John got into a postgraduate facility called the Chrysler Institute of Engineering. Okay. So the way what that was their focus? Uh, they focus on Ford cars. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, it's weird. I had a feeling. The name was weird. It yeah, was a it's bit a bad a, name. Yeah. Um, so the way that work is you would work and get an education at the same time. Okay. So you're basically getting a master's while you are uh, working. Right. So you, and you're making bank. So like oh making, oh wow. So like a, a paid money. internship while you're going to school. Yeah. Could you imagine paying an intern? It's hard. It's hard to imagine paying kids in college anything for their yeah. You know. Yeah. Work. John uh, got a master's in automotive engineering. Okay. And then he went to school at night to get while he's working at the factory. He's going to school at night. Gets an MBA from the University of Michigan. Okay. So. Uh, that was why he's at Chrysler. He's not at Chrysler long before he uh, takes a job at Packard in research and development. Okay. So he was at Chrysler for like a year after going through the school and doing all the sure the business. Um, it's 1953 now. He's making the equivalent of $130,000 today. So, so what, he's like 20? Yeah, he's super young. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Uh, he, he lived with his mom until he uh, married Elizabeth Higgins in 1954. Okay. So he's... Living at home, making 130. It's a great move. Yeah. Great move. Yeah. John was then lured away by GM. Mm. GM offered him his choice of a job in any of GM's divisions. Hmm. So they were just like, whatever you want. You you may have a job in any of our divisions. How many divisions do Five. they have? Okay. But still. It's a good amount, but it's not like... I know, a but, thousand. but usually they're like, we have a job available. Right. Well, in the, right Not, now it's like. like you're, now it's just like, you, oh, no. Here, you're, you eat bolts. Are you in? Yes. All right. Stop crying. <laughs> Stop crying. I also eat, sc eat screws in my other job. Oh, you idiot. And I eat wood in my third job. Oh, Jesus. Well, get to eating the bolts. I still am on food stamps because the three jobs don't Well, you don't enough. have any room for food in your belly. You're full of metallics. America's weird. And less cry, cry, more munch, munch. John picked the Pontiac division. Interesting. Well, we all know Pontiac's <laughs> it's still a hot car. That's right. Every time I see a Pontiac now, I'm like, unicorn. <laughs> it's always turquoise. Uh, GM was the biggest car company on earth, but Pontiac was struggling. It had no identity. Um, his boss, Bunky Knudsen. What just you, happened? I fucking said it. Bunky? That's the guy's name. Bunky, Bunky? Knudsen. Bunky Knudsen. Okay. The bunk. Sure. Um, he starts to form a relationship with NASCAR. Okay. Bunky does. Bun well, a lot of Bunkies have connections to NASCAR. Boom. That's right. Yeah. It's one of the biggest names in NASCAR. Sure, yeah. Bunky liked to say, quote, you can't sell an old man's car to a young man, but you can sell a young man's car to an old man. Hey, Bunkyisms. I got bunk talk. Yeah. Bunky is pretty much the only guy in the car business thinking this way. Okay. No one was thinking about selling cars to young people. Cars were big and they drove smooth and Detroit guys could not imagine why anyone would want anything different. Right. So right, they're just those big boats that just fucking feel like you're riding on glass. Right. Um, this was known as the Detroit mind. Okay. It became known as the Detroit mind. John became successful at Pontiac in 1961. Bernie became uh, Bunky, Bunky, became general manager at Chevrolet. And at 36, John became division chief engineer at Pontiac. Okay. After work, the engineers would test drive prototypes that would never, ever make it to a dealership. Interesting. Woodward Avenue became a drag strip. Okay. So they're just trying out <laughs> right, different just... types of cars that are never going to be anything. That's pretty fun. GM prohibited the production of high-performance cars that alluded to racing or high speed. Oh, wow. Yeah. Different time. <laughs> so they would not... They, the goal was really more stability and dependability yeah, family versus car. like something... Right. It's fun. Right, yeah. Something um, you want to put flames on. That's right. Right. In January 1963, a memo came out stating GM cars were banned from racing activities. Okay. So they must have heard about the... Right, the after-hour racing. Yeah, drag racing. Right. GM cars had to weigh at least 10 or more pounds per cubic in inch of engine displacement. So that would mean they would not be fast enough for racing. Okay. So they actually had a 
um, uh, they a were formula to weight the cars down so they wouldn't go so far. they would not be fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So your parents designed cars now. That's right. Right. But John started to wonder what would happen if you took a big V8 engine, uh -huh. made for a full size car, and you put it into a smaller car. Sure. Sure. Turns out it's a super fast, very powerful, very drivable car. With the head of Pontiac's approval, John snuck the engine past the GM Engineering Policy Committee by selling it as a package for the 1964 Tempest. So cars are going out, uh -huh. and then, or you put in an order for a car, and th they don't notice that he's like putting this engine into a smaller car. Okay. Which they're totally so opposed to. So he's engine smuggling? Yeah, basically, he's engine smuggling. He's, he's uh, I think they call it hiding the engine. Uh, sure. In the business. Sure. He's pulling a fast engine. Oh, he's pulling a fast engine. Uh, so he calls it the GTO package. So you go to the dealership, you go, I want the GTO package, and they throw in a fast fucking <laughs> yeah, thing. Right. Sit down, sir. We'll be a minute. He took, he took the name from Ferrari. Um, this is the first muscle car. Wow. They sold 5,000 before GM figured out what was going on. And they're just they're they're they just, just thinking they're just like it's a package for a car. They're not no one's paying attention to the fact because it's an edict. You don't put that right. you don't put that in the car. Yeah. Um, muscle cars immediately became big sellers. The Chevy Chevelle, the Dodge Charger, the Barracuda followed. GM invented the muscle car and then Ford took it over. The Mustang came out and sold one point five million in two years. Wow! So it's the fucking thing, right? For defining the company policy and creating a new car, John became the youngest division head in 1965. Right. Yeah, that is what you do, right? Yeah. You're like, we are fucking furious at your behavior, John. How dare you? Here's your new office, and well done. Really, thank you for not listening to our bullshit. Um, Whoa, think, that's I, him, huh? I think that's Bunky. Oh, that's Bunky. Man in the tiger suit? What does that even mean? Although that could be him. That St. John. Well, that says it's DeLorean. Um, yeah, that that might that might be that might be him when he's young. Looks like he's in the CIA. He's, he's gonna he's gonna change a lot, so that's why hmm. that'll throw you off. Hmm. Um, so uh, so he's young, right? For what, having what all of this power. Twenty four, and, and he's thirty six. Oh, but that's still young yeah, for yeah. the position he's in. Um, he became he becomes the youngest division head in nineteen sixty five. Okay. There was a lot of fighting between division heads at GM, and it didn't help that the young guy who broke the rules was now an equal to the older guys who paid their dues. Oh, they just you can see how, hated oh my it. God. The guys who oh, just want uh, the car to drive slowly down uh, the road, and then this fucker comes along, blows everything out of the water. Well, here we go. What does DeLorean have for us? Now he's an equal. Pontiac pushed GM limits on advertising. One campaign they came up with was to embrace Tiger's. So thus the Tiger suit. That's right headline but what does that mean embrace tigers dealers gave out orange and black license plates and tiger tails to be hung on antennas or on the back license plate fucking cool fuck yeah it is the first gto commercial in 1965 featured a tiger jumping uh, out from under a hood yeah by the way not a great gig for the tiger actor okay uh not an actor uh an actual tiger and uh, and then to make this commercial you have to get the tiger in the hood and close the hood right uh, Fun. So to do that, they ended up using 40 pounds of raw meat in the commercial. Wow, that'll get me in a car. <laughs> so they throw 40 pounds of meat in, and the tiger's like, all right, I'll do your goddamn commercial. I think they just That's the problem with animals. They don't know they're filming these no, things. No, they have no idea. Yeah, they're just like, this these. is torture. I love the meat, though. Until you get 40 pounds of meat involved. Pontiac uh, won the Motor Trend Car of the Year Award. Next, the ad team had G a GTO jumping a small gully in an ad, and the other Jump, a, a gully, a gully, a gully, different. Uh, a gully is very different. It's yeah, um, weirder. So the now the other heads of the GM divisions are furious because they're showing like a fucking daredevil right. shit. Yeah, um, and then John was told to find a more responsible way to sell the car. Mm. The GM chairman besides said, tigers and gully leaps. Well, the GM chairman said no more tiger comparisons because sure. it's too aggressive. Right. Three years of tiger promotions were dead. They started calling the GTO the Great One in ads. Okay. So back then, um, so now they get Wayne Gretzky. Now they get Wayne Gretzky. So now back then, Detroit car executives are celebrities. Wow. Because it's the biggest company going. Right. 
And then if you get that position, you're a super powerful guy sure. and you're just known. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And John, just like now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, they don't we all to... know. We all name the GM heads. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to put their heads on pikes. Well. Oh. Uh, John. So John's a big celebrity. He's a young guy. He invented the muscle car. He has access to 40 pounds of meat. Um, 40 He's pounds a of gully meat. rebel. That's right. Goal, goal, goal rebel. Hmm? Hmm? Um, magazines write articles about him. He became known as the exec who understood youth. Right. He gets the kids. He gets them. And he remade himself in that image. He quit smoking, lost weight, grew out his sideburns, dyed his hair black, wore turtlenecks, bell bottoms, and a peace symbol on a necklace. Mm, okay. So he's a costume shop. Well, GM is a very conservative uh, place. So that's not him. That's a picture of somebody else. Okay. Um, GM is a very conservative place. Uh, oh, so wow. it's weird that he is doing that. That's him um, not, yeah, he not looks... dressed. Uh, this is more uh, what we're looking at. What is? And there he is just doing some chest. Well, this is something from a magazine. Some chest workouts. Oh. Wow. Okay. So he's, he's just on a bench. With a couple of dumbbells um, working the pecs. Without a shirt on. No shirt. Um, so Jim's a very conservative corporation. Everyone wears a suit, and then there's this guy. And then you've guy. got this guy who's just doing pec work. When John uh, was out of the office, he had his shirt unbuttoned down to the middle of his torso. Mm. He got a facelift. Whoa, that's sure. And an implant to reshape his jaw. Jesus Christ. Yeah, he's fucking killing John, it. I don't know if he's killing it. Sounds like he's got some demons. Um, yeah. Well, this might be a middle life, midlife crisis situation also. Okay. Um, he told Fortune Magazine he had reconstructive surgery after going through uh, a windshield in a car wreck. I was uh, hopping over a gully that had a tiger in the engine and uh, smashed into it. Um, and then he, uh, and then when they checked on the, the, the racetrack, he said he got in the... Mm -hmm. The race I got was like, yeah, that didn't happen. Right. <laughs> but that's what you got to do. Or at least that's what you had to do when you had plastic surgery back then, right? You kind of yeah. came up with a facial alibi. Yeah, facial alibi. All right. So, um, so, so reporters, reporters uh, would come to his home. Like he would just invite reporters in. He wants to show everybody how he's living. You know, he's yeah. very accessible to the press. Um, he'd drive reporters to work while blasting Jefferson Airplane. Yeah. He With his fake John facelift. Yeah. Oh, this is normal. <laughs> he'd talk about the... You know, one head makes you smaller and the other one makes you large. Um, are you sure your jaw isn't... It's fine. I got into an accident at the racetrack. Yeah. You look normal. Like you I look even... normal. I am normal. Yeah. Well, one pill makes you larger, one pill makes you small. Okay. But the one the mother gives you, what you really see? I don't want to talk to you anymore. Whoo! Uh, so uh, he'd also t talk about the Beach Boys, quote French philosophers, and talk about historian Peter Gay's writings on human misery. He told one reporter he was writing a novel about nuclear war. Mm. He also loved to show off his abs. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a little Elon Musky, right? For, yes. Right. I mean, yes. he's just sort of like it's very Elon, Musk, especially the way the press is treating him. Yeah, and he's not. He's like he's no longer behind the scenes, so now he's leading into the absurdity of the character that has sort of been yes, developed. Very much. Right. He said he didn't understand why auto execs felt they had to vote Republican, and he studied FM rock radio to get intel on the love generation. What did he studied FM radio? Don't you ever study FM radio when no, you're trying to figure no, out what's going on while. with somebody? It's been a while. If you want to know the kids, you what study FM kids radio. Why don't we fire up the old FM? Reporters just sucked up what he said. The local press, not as taken as the national. One paper ran a gospel art article about an anonymous auto exec who got plastic surgery. Mm, who was it? I don't know. They mm. never said. Mm. Anonymous. I don't know. John Elizabeth's marriage fell apart in 1968. I can't believe I he's know. still married. Oh, I was going to say, I can't believe they got divorced. I thought, no, I can't I believe she hung in there. With a new jaw, a new face, new attitude, he's, always lifting weights. He's awesome. Yeah. 
He he's sounds a little douchey. He's pretty awesome. Okay. Um, she sued him for cruelty, and she got the house. And she showed reporters bills from a plastic surgeon in Switzerland that kept coming in the mail. Oh, man. <laughs> that's, that's why you just pay right away. One lump sum. Yeah, you you got, got the money. Yeah, no reason. You don't want though. these Swiss face bills chasing you for the rest of your life. That's right. I've been there. John then started uh, spending time in California. Not good. Popular mechanics. Quote, John would descend the steps from the GM corporate plane with his sunglasses on and his coat over one arm. Ready to party is an accurate description. <laughs> no, right, 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 DeLorean. Um, he dated uh, Ursula Andress, Candace Bergen, Nancy Sinatra, and Raquel Welsh. Wow. Jesus. Raquel Welsh is fairly attractive. Raquel Welsh is an attractive person. So uh, is Candace Bergen. And he, the others I'm not familiar with. Really? Who is the other first one? Ursula Andress. Who's that? I think she was a Bond girl. Um, she's she's a fairly... Nancy Sinatra? You know Nancy oh, Sinatra? her I know, yeah. Boots are meant for walking, yeah. right? That's it. Uh, her so dad he, did something. Her, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... He's hanging out with big uh, stars uh, at executive members only nightclubs. This is so Elon Musk. This is so GM. Classic GM. Yeah. Some weeks he flew out to California on a Thursday and would head back to Detroit on a Tuesday. It's a pretty good sketch. One time he tossed a junior exec lipstick and said Nancy Sinatra wanted a Firebird that color and to do it in four days. Oh, boy. So he's getting a little... Uh, Losing the plot a little? <laughs> Losing the plot at the office a touch? <laughs> Um, so, uh, so he falls in love again. Okay. 1969. Okay. This time with Kelly Harmon. Ah. Her dad was a college football legend, war hero, and sportscaster. Okay. Her brother would become known as actor Mark Harmon. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. So it's a, it's a family, right? It's a, it's a Bel Air rich, uh, family. You didn't go to it yet. Well. Um, oh wow! Yeah, they are. Well, this the Harmons. Is, this is a better one. Look how stupid they look. Oh God, with the dog. Yeah, he's got his turtleneck on. He looks like the turtleneck he's wearing is made from the dog. <laughs> uh, so she's twenty. He's forty-four. Do you bring up that your wife got a house out of a cruelty suit to your new love? <laughs> hey. Well, she's twenty. How you know? Yeah, but you're what, like, do you, what, yeah, are you, what are you guys talking about at all? That's yeah, true. Um, they married at the Bel Air Country Club. John wrote a song for Kelly that the Robert Mitchell, Mitchell Boys Choir sang. Kelly told the reporter, quote, I like riding, skiing, water skiing, music, swimming, poetry, parties, and dogs. She's 20. Yep. <laughs> yep. That sounds like a 20-year-old list. <laughs> John start, starts driving a Maserati instead of a GM car. That's an interesting move. I mean, <laughs> I mean you've made a number Christ. of them. <laughs> Why not? Okay. Yeah. I'm sure GM was like, cool. Hey, John, you know, uh, Saturday and Sunday are the days off. We, have we been clear? <laughs> um, they adopt a son named Zachary. Okay. His dad had died the year before, uh, John's dad. Okay. He died the year before of throat cancer. Oh, are you getting emotional? I'm sorry. And after the Ford factory called John and asked him to come pick up his dad's toolbox. Jesus. But that's also like Ford being. Uh, yeah, who wins there? Yeah, I don't know who wins, but like you're calling like the head of a division of gym. Hey, come pick up your dad's hey, tool dad's tools are here. Hopefully you don't weep all over them. Both Kelly and John disliked Detroit social life. Okay. They told the reporter they'd rather go on a moonlight horseback ride than go to a Bloomfield Hills cocktail party. Kelly starts spending. There's other options. No, that's it. Oh. You either go on a, a nighttime. Horse ride. Horse ride in the moonlight, yeah. or you go to the Bloomfield Hills cocktail parties. Right. There's nothing in between. Okay. It just seems like... That's it. There's a movie, maybe. No, that's what we got. Dancing or... Um, By the way, wasn't Detroit like the shit back then? Yeah. So they were just like, now... There's a lot of money in Detroit back then. Yeah. Um, same as now. Mm, right. <laughs> yeah. Kelly starts spending more and more time in California without John. That's not a good sign. He's the gateway. Yeah. Uh, none of this slowed down John's career at GM. The new model Camaro was due out next year, and it was behind schedule. 
and redesigns for the Corvette and Nova were lagging. <laughs> okay. The Nova. Yeah. So over the past four years, there have been a lot of bad publicity from recalls and other issues. So John was put in charge of the Chevrolet division. It's a big division. Another bump. Yep. By 1971, Chevrolet had sales of over 3 million cars. His division alone was almost as much as all of Ford. Wow. That's how much he's selling. So he's and good. He's Im- right, he's good. Okay. He's good at right. his job. Okay. But he's also party and, boy. And a bit of a douche. Uh, a bit of a douche. Yeah. In between, he's flying to L.A. And again, his ex-wife got a house because of his cruelty. That's a, yeah, that's yeah. a bad word. It's not good. Yeah. Um, so uh, he's flying to L.A. He's hanging out with Sam and Davis Jr., Johnny Carson. I love your crazy cars, babe. But take your eye out. Your cars are so wild. I can't believe you got a tiger in the hood of one of them. That's just nuts. Is that Carson? Yeah. <laughs> um... He started looking for more ways to make money. He bought a piece of the San Diego Chargers and a piece. I'm on charge of receivers. Uh, just a little bit, and the New York Yankees. Okay. He was put on uh, boards of startups. Getting involved with other businesses really did not go over well at GM. He's supposed to only care about. He's GM. like a one man Shark Tank. Like in in GM world, they're like, this is all you would ever want By to the way, work at and GM. What, I mean, he's killing it. He is killing it. So you would think that that would be true. He's making shitloads of money. Right. He's he's very successful. Yeah. But it's he's not still enough. Want, yeah, he wants more. Kelly and John split in 1972. Saw this one coming. I did not. You wrote it. A magazine photographer came to his house and took pictures of John wandering around his estate. Hold on. Let me get my dumbbells. Wearing nothing but jeans. Hot. I mean, let me get my dumbbells? Yeah. Um... So he's he's kind of making the divorce. Uh, Did he marry Kelly? Yeah, they were married. Oh, okay. Remember he had a, he sang her a song. And he had oh, I didn't know that. That was I thought that was just like date six shit. No, that was the that was the marriage. It's a big closure. Um, but but he's like he's like taking the divorce and making it into a like a publicity thing. Like for him, like oh, I'm sad. I'm walking around without my shirt on. I can't even face my shirts anymore. What do I do? I got nothing. Just these jeans and a dream. <laughs> Just the jeans and, and a dream. Oh boy. Um, I couldn't. Yeah, I looked for him earlier, but I couldn't find any pictures of him. Just shirtless and jeans. Um. So um. <laughs> We've still got that dumbbell one. <laughs> uh, uh. So he's sad. Obviously, sure. uh, John won custody of Zachary. His friends in Hollywood treated him to a weekend in Malibu with three sex workers who looked like Kelly. That's that's you a know, friend. That's nice. Friends. That's nice. Th- that's that's what nice. friends to do. get three Kellys. Three Kell- yeah. for a weekend for the guy. Yeah, that's sweet. It's that's, great. That's friends. It's called being a nice guy. Yeah, some friends would probably just want to be emotionally supportive, uh-huh, but no. then you know or if you can get three girl. doppelgangers yeah. who will bang you. That's right. Doppelbangers. Yeah. Then Go with you it. do that. Go That's with classic it. GM yeah. stuff. That's in the handbook. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure they're happy to hear that. Yeah. Hey, John, it's Wednesday. Where you been? Sorry, I was banging three almost Kellys all weekend. <laughs> anyway, what new car do I need to put a tiger in? <laughs> a friend, quote, he said it was the classiest thing anyone had ever done for him. So he doesn't know what classy is. <laughs> that, that was his phrase, classy. Classy. He also said no one in Detroit had, had enough class to do something like that. Nobody in Detroit is as there's, classy as you guys. There's no way anybody in Detroit is going to buy me an escort that looks exactly like my wife. That's just Detroit classy behavior. Fucking That's sucks. just classy. Detroit would never do that. They're not classy. They don't get it. That same year, John was on a plane when he saw a model and actress Christine Farrar in Vogue magazine. Okay. He tore the five-page spread out and put it in his briefcase. So if you're sitting next to him, you're like, oh, he's going to murder her. (laughs) Oh, he's going to murder that model for sure. So, quote, I felt a bit sheepish like a teenager with a crush on a movie star. Yeah, you're a fucking weirdo putting pictures in your pants. Um, Well, briefcase, but. Oh, my briefcase is normally in my pocket. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of a wallet. This um, is classic me. So she's 22, he's 48. But he's like this is the this is the hot hot girl for me. Mm-hmm. Normal. It's normal stuff. Yeah. Well, by the way, that's got, now how dating apps are essentially. So 
He's got. He's, he's ahead got of a, his time. He's he's got a, a crush, forty eight year old guy with a crush on a twenty two year old. Yeah. Who he's taken, and by the way, it's not an, like you rip out one picture. Sure, you can get away with saying it's the perfume or something. You rip out five, you are a psychopath. You remember her? Oh yeah. Um. What do I know her from? She uh she did some movies, but you probably just know her from, um her modeling. Like yeah, her, I know her from her Max Factor. That's right. Uh, so he's now John is now promoted again. He is now exec <laughs> czar of cars. He is now exec in charge of GM's North American car and truck division. So he's the fucking shit. Right. Um, but with all the success, he still feels empty. Sure. He told his tanks on E. Uh, yeah, man. It's tough. That's right. Tough business. He told author Gail Sheehy, quote, here I was spending my life bending the fenders a little differently to try and convince the public they were going to get a new and dramatically different product. I, I'm sorry. Does he have car block? He has. Is that what we're like? He's painting this. Yeah, right. But he's painting this as like he's got some sort like. It's not block. He's saying like he doesn't feel. Yeah, but I'm not creatively stimulated anymore. That's I'm right. just bending fenders. That's <laughs> just pulling one over on the public again. <laughs> What gross excess. It was ridiculous. I thought there's got to be more to life than this. Am I doing the thing God would have me do here on earth? Excuse me, John. Is it true you ripped out five pictures of a woman on a plane? God wanted me to do that. Okie dokie. God wants me to jerk off when I'm back in the hotel. <laughs> John, John, you're on mic. I know. Uh, well, we're going to end the interview with you. I'm going to take off my shirt. Keep it on, you asshole. Mm, God oh, Jesus. Damn it. These jeans are tight, are they not? Yeah, no, they're too tight for sure. Tight like a V8 engine in a Tempest. You know You're what I'm an idiot. About? That's, where's the door? Fellow There's GM. No door. Fellow GM and execs did not like John. Yeah. He talked too much in interviews. The way he dressed was unprofessional. He made no friends at GM during his rise. One of his bosses at GM warned him now that he had made it to the executive floor. So this this move put him on the the, mm -hmm. the power floor. So now you've floor. got the guys like, all right. Literally, it's the 14th floor. He made it on the power floor. Right. Uh, so this exec warns him now that he's there, he should, quote, disappear into the wallpaper. Hmm. Fucking play it cool, man. You made it. You made it. You're on the 14th floor, You're Johnny boy. Play it cool. Go live in the wall. John was to give a speech at a GM conference about quality control and how it affects GM's bottom line. Okay. Days before the conference, the speech was leaked to the Detroit News. Papers across the country ran the story. The New York Times headline was, quote, GM warns its executives to improve auto quality. Mm -hmm. John, so it makes it sound like he's talking shit about the quality. Of the, yeah. Right. John screamed that he had been double crossed. So a GM, GM hired a private investigator to look into it and into John. Oh, the boy, I think you're biting off more than you can chew here, right? Yep. Is this, you've asked for too much? I want to know who did it. Well, we're going to investigate the company and you. You know what? Let's call this let's all not, off. We don't need to do this. We don't need to do this. I'm just what? a guy. We were good. I'm a guy. It's just a speech. I'm a guy. I'm a, I'm going to take my shirt off. I'm going to lose just, the shirt for yeah, sure. It's coming That's off. the first order of business is the shirt is coming off. In September 1972, John, Lee f John finally met the girl he had selected out of a uh, 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 Vogue magazine like it was a menu. He met Christine at a Gucci show, but she was dating another rich guy, it turns out. Mm, someone had ripped her magazine clippings out a little too quickly. That's right. Luckily, that rich guy died when he crashed his plane near Santa Barbara. Boom! John waited a month or so, then asked Christine to lunch. For sure. You got to give that time period. And it's also a month and a lunch. Yeah. Suave. Very. You yeah. don't want to do a two week and dinner. Dinner. Fuck no. You do a month and a lunch. You look like a crazy person. You look like a psychopath. Yeah. Hide your psychosis. That's right. You do a month and a lunch. John said he, quote, wanted Christine for Christmas. So he's now what the devil? <laughs> Is that fair? The PI delivered his 19-page report on John in early 1973. Hey, so uh, GM's pretty fine. John's a psychopath. John's fucking crazy. John's crazy. John, put your shirt on. I can't. I don't have any. 
It contained, quote, certain allegations about John's personal life. Okay. And it said the person probably responsible for leaking his speech to the press was John. Was John DeLorean. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> GM announces John's resignation in April 1973. Mm. The company never said a word about why he left. Even right. to this day, they've never said why he left. His bonuses were paid. He was put in charge of a nonprofit GM ran. That way he could keep some salary. Okay. Um, and given a Cadillac dealership in Florida. Okay. Three weeks after being let go, John married Christine. Jesus. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There you go. Sorry. Was I being too... Uh, Tappy? Was I... Oh, our fans don't care about the sound. <laughs> <laughs> Since uh, GM never said anything about why he left, John was able to control the story. Okay. He became the guy who fired GM. Oh, yeah. And, right. And walked away from a 600. That's how it works. Yeah. Employees fire the business. All the time. Right. He was the guy who walked away from a $650,000 job. Because he wanted to move to Florida. Yeah. With his yeah. new magazine and, wife. And his cads. He went on the lecture circuit and wrote opinion pieces. He was the car business guy and took the old ga old guard to task for their refusal to change. Sure. It was perfect timing as the OPEC oil embargo hit and everyone wondered why America only made huge cars. Right. So he's the man of the fucking hour. Okay. John then connected with a former car salesman, Roy Nesseth. Whose office was just a payphone at a bar. That's oh, man, no. don't you long for those days? Oh my god. Hey, how you doing? It's Roy. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I'll get her. Hold on. It's not for me. Hello, Roy's car business. <laughs> yeah, it's also a bar. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, we're open till midnight. All right. Hello, Roy here, car business. He's getting a lot of calls. He's getting a lot of calls. They're not another for him. That's the beauty of this man. Okay, yeah, we got a bunch of potato chips for sale behind the bar, a quarter each. Uh, yeah, I'm also a car guy. Uh, Roy's <laughs> car business! <laughs> um, I wonder if we can find him. What's his name? Roy Nesseth. Yep. Oh, Roy Ne... Oh, whoa. Which one is he? Is he all of them? Oh, there it is. Huh. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, he looks. He looks like looks a like a guy. Yeah, he looks like a guy who answers a phone at a bar like it's his. <laughs> uh, so, so they team up. Uh, they start working on deals together. Okay. A car dealer let John buy into his dealership, and then he watched as John and Roy just ran up huge debts against the business. The dealer ended up walking away from his own business. These guys fired GM. <laughs> they. Bullshit. <laughs> the dealer, quote, DeLorean uses Mystique to put the deal together, and then he pu puts the rape in. The guy is a demon underneath. I tried to tell people, but I gave up talking because nobody would listen. I mean, giving up talking is frustrating. So that sounds like what the mob does. They come into a business, then they load it with debt, and or they a take president. all the money out. Or a president. Yeah. That's correct. You're talking about uh, Carter? Clinton. Clinton. Everyone since Reagan. That's right. Everyone <laughs> since <laughs> Christina and John were having trouble making a baby. Uh, so she visited a New York palm reader and advisor named Sonia. This is not a good idea. Sonia put a glass of tap water under Christina's chair at the beginning of the session. At the end of the session, she retrieved it. It was full of blood. What just happened? Blood what? glass. She put a glass of, sorry. This glass of tap water. Put a glass. It doesn't matter if it's from the tap. But well, she put it, it under her chair. Under the chair. And then when she was done with her session, the tap when water was... Blood. Blood. Okay. So... You can I, see. You can see. It sounds like Detroit's water. Is it from you, Detroit? No. Oh. But you can see the... What's going on. Yes. She's uh, basically a doc doctor. Yes. For she sure. Knows. Yes. The psychic... Yeah. This is a this is a person who's a medically trained mm -hmm. um, individual. Mm -hmm. That's how you know... Now drink the blood, Christine. Now drink the blood. You'll be pregnant mm. with a baby. So, okay. So, yeah, it's obviously, very normal. she's very, very good. And yep. She's good at what she does. Yeah. Uh, Christina went, ho went home and asked John for 10000 to give Sonia because um, she was going to help her get pregnant. Sure. Uh, so, he did it. Great. Uh, and by the way, 
I'll let you know if any of this sounds crazy. You got it. Okay. Uh, and Christina, sure enough, got pregnant. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Great. Yeah. Um, after they had a daughter, John started seeing Sonia privately. Oh boy. What's wrong? I feel like he's, you know, hmm? being John. <laughs> Uh, so burning people was a pattern with Roy and John. There were others like an investor in Phoenix, a rancher in Idaho. So they're just kind of sucking money out of people. Right. Uh, while doing all this, John planned his big return to the automobile business. The chief stylist of the Lamborghini drew him up plans for the DMC 12. It looked like nothing else out there. A rear engine car with wing doors and a stainless steel body. <laughs> It still is the car that if you see it, I am like, oh, my God, look at it. <laughs> I, you still can't believe its existence. Yeah, totally. It is like it's like if cocaine made a car. That's right. Yeah. Uh, he also wanted to golf. And not a lot of people know that actually what happened was he put a glass of water under his chair. That's and right. when he got up, there was a DeLorean. That's right. The DMC. And blood. Just and blood. And blood. a ton of blood. A lot of blood. <laughs> a lot. So much blood. <laughs> Um, he was also adamant that uh, golf clubs would fit in the trunk. <laughs> Great. So, sorry, got a really good car designer. Um, he told the designer the engines in the back. Yeah, rear engine, like a Porsche. Right. All right. Uh, he told his designers, "Quote: This car is aimed at a particular section of the market. Me, the horny bachelor who's made it. Oh God! Yeah, Jesus Christ! Fuck yeah, baby!" Ugh. Starting a new car company, uh, very difficult. No independent car maker had taken on GM and survived since the 1920s. Okay. So no bank would give him money because it's just a crazy idea. Okay. Uh, in September 1978, DeLorean Research got $12.5 million from investors. Okay. People like Sam and Davis Jr. Sing I'm in, babe. Singer Roy Clark. Hey, who am I? And... <laughs> And the chairman of uh, Pan Am Airlines. Bully! <laughs> uh, come for the impressions, stay for the confusion. <laughs> the money was moved through Swiss banks and a company... Always not shady. <laughs> and, and then a company based in Panama. Perfect. The two best... The best way to do it. <laughs> Go offshore. Two best places for money. Get the Bahamas involved already. He was supposed to... The money was supposed to go to Lotus Cars, who are now helping design... Uh, the DeLorean, mm -hmm. but only 137,000 made it. It's a lot that didn't. No one notices at the time that the money's disappeared hmm. because really who's keeping track of it? The messengers sure. gave money, they wouldn't know. Right. So John turns to governments to try to build a factory. Okay. In 1978, he signed an agreement to build a factory on an old Air Force base in Puerto Rico. Okay. Yeah, and celebrate it because this is a big fucking deal sure. to get a car company to build a factory. Sure. And then John announced that he got a better offer from the UK and Puerto Rico was out. Okay. Instead, he would build this car factory in Northern Ireland in Dunmurry, just outside of Belfast. Okay. Uh, the land that he was given was between two housing developments. One twin brook was mostly full of Catholics who were driven out of Belfast by sectarian violence. The setup and makes the other me worry about was the other side. Full of Protestants. So the the factory would be right in between them. Perfect. And then sign that lease. <laughs> get your get the ink on the lease now. Uh, the deal was done by the labor government along with the National Irish Development Agency. The company would get 150 million dollars. Okay. So the British and and the Irish are like, we're gonna, we're gonna get people jobs because right. unemployment is fucking crazy bad at this point. Sure, in Ireland, um, which is also great for IRA recruitment and and just fucking troubles in general. Right. Perfect. Um, John told a fellow car maker, "Quote: I'm starting to think that God stuck me here to be part of the solution to the crisis in Northern Ireland." Absolutely, very healthy thought. Absolutely, very healthy. Yep, God did Normal. that. God, yep. yep, God wanted him. Hey, to. just build your crazy car. <laughs> I think I'm here to help these people. John came to Dunmurray, uh, came to Dunmurray to break ground on the factory on October 2nd, 1978. But they'd already broken the ground with bombs. But, but as, as he and a member of the Labor Party dug holes, a chain link fence held back protesters who chanted Brits out and Yankee go home. It's not. It's all fine. It's not welcoming. Yeah, it's good. Okay. 
Construction began soon after, but the Irish laborers did not want to cut down a small hawthorn tree because they said it was a fairy tree. Hmm. Who do we root for right now? <laughs> you can't cut that one down. She's a fairy tree. We can't make the factory here. No, we've just harvested her. According to legend, if someone cut down a fairy tree, he would lose a limb. Okay. So that's a great reason to not do it. Let him do it. Lose the limb. So all the bulldozers, so they're building the factory, but all the bulldozers and trucks, everything's avoiding this one <laughs> hawthorn tree. Okay. Um, then all the workers show up one morning and the tree was gone. And the Irish workers said, quote, bad sign. It's a dark day. You have wrecked everything we're building. The fairy tree will see to that. Sure. Okay. In January 1979, the Wall Street Journal wrote a story under the headline, Taking on Detroit. John DeLorean says he'll show industry how to build cars. So the Dunmurray factory opened in 1980. It had separate entrances for Catholic and Protestant workers. Jesus. That's the best kind of factory. It just feels like it's ripe for problems. John was not a fan of Belfast and was worried he'd be abducted or killed. Well, he lost the fairy tree. That's right. Once you took down the fairy tree, all bets are off. It's over. It's like a Tales from the Crypt. There were a lot of businessmen being kidnapped then in uh, Belfast, and he told them, he told his staff to get him a bulletproof trench coat because he heard Kissinger had one. Jesus. Yeah, that's the guy you want to be following. <laughs> what did Kissinger have? You give me that. He often flew and slept in London instead of staying in Northern Ireland. Oh, my God. The company rented two floors in a Park Avenue building in New York. John's office had a view of Central Park. He hung a huge photo of himself. It's always a good sign. Big poster-sized photo. It's good. Uh, he's shirtless in jeans. Oh, what a douche. S- Jesus Christ. <laughs> sitting on a rock with his son ah. looking at the ocean. Ah, jump like, in it. It sounded like the photographer just captured him naturally with his sure, son. Sure, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> John took 78000 from the company to move his family to New York from okay. Detroit. They found a comfortable 20-room uh, apartment on Fifth Avenue. Sure, just, sure. 20, Enough for three. No, 20, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. You so, got the you know, around bedroom. Just under bedroom, seven bedroom, per person, I think Bedroom, that's fine. bedroom, kitchen, dining room. Yeah. Spare room. Yeah, spare weight room, room. Spare room. Shirt weight room, room. Shirt room. Jeans room. Uh-huh. Blood chair room. Um, pictures of myself room. Room of yourself. Um, pictures of things um, that I want to do. Yeah. Inspiration room. Yeah. Um, blood. Blood room. I blood already room. said that. I already counted uh, the blood room. Blood glass room. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think fairy tree. Uh, the place fairy, where you put all the fairy, fairy trees tree, that uh, you stole limb, from limbs, the land. Limbs your limbs. Guys yeah. Your, lost your leopard limbs. Yeah. Um, probably a den. How about a den? Some yeah. with a bearskin rug. <laughs> so... Accounting company Arthur Anderson was hired to audit the business and found nothing amiss. Well, it's time for them to go out of business. Well, Anderson would later go down as part of the Enron Enron implosion. Oh, good. (laughs) Stomping ground. The car company paid for chauffeurs, servants, cars for Christine and her brother, and an art collection. And the British are paying for all of this. It's a part of the $150 they put down. Oh, boy. But then Margaret Thatcher was elected. Oh, the Iron Lady. Thatcher had no interest in helping the working man and absolutely no interest in helping Belfast. Right. John hired a... No, br- I'm a bit of a bitch. <laughs> oh, hi. Hello. Hi, how are you? Yes. We've never had you on the podcast before. Well, I'm but... like Reagan the Lady. Yeah, I hate yes. you. I hate everything about I you. I hate you. I hate... I don't like Shame Chamber. It's not funny. Uh... I don't like the way you uh, just killed entire towns of humans. No, stop. <laughs> Enough. And the Falklands, really? Oh, good Lord. Get over it. John hired a British secretary to try to smooth things over with the government. So he hired <laughs> someone who's... who's hey, been, I hired one of you. Fam- familiar with uh, the processes of Hey, sweetheart, politics. do me a favor. Don't get me a shirt. Hey, it's me, Johnny D. Uh, but William Haddad, one of John's execs said John was losing it. John often thought an IRA hit squad was coming for him. And he asked uh, Haddad to put him in contact with Israeli intelligence because he had a plan to seize Saudi oil fields. Holy shit. Those dots barely connect. (laughs) 
Good God. So he wants, he's worried the IRA is coming after him. So he gets involved with Israeli uh, army people in order to take over Saudi oil fields. What would you do? It's called being a businessman. I just want to cut down the goddamn ferry tree. Just, he kept ask, also asking about that bulletproof trench coat. Hey, where's it was that uh, technology that we barely don't have? <laughs> you guys watch uh, the Bond guy, right? Right. Well, one of them jackets. Come on. They're going to throw hats at me that'll cut my head off if we're not careful. John talked to fewer and fewer people. There was only one person he really trusted. John. Sonia, the palm reader. Oh, what? <laughs> God damn. I think I thought my answer was crazy. <laughs> he consulted her before he made every big decision. She took his money and told him everything would be okay. That's great. What a great gig for like a psychic. Oh, the best. Yeah, yeah, do that. Sign this and here and here. In 1980, the American Express Christmas catalog included an $85,000 gold limited edition DeLorean. So they, they send out a their... gold DeLorean? So they send it out in the catalog and say that you can get a gold DeLorean. <laughs> Only 100 are offered. Uh-huh. First 100 people. Only two people bought one. Oh, my God. What? But eighty five thousand dollars back then, like you get a Porsche for a Porsche for the twenties. Still, right? so, you would think a hundred people would buy. I mean, you're talking like that's like a comparatively like a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar car or something. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Um, DeLoreans began leaving the factory uh, to be sold in the U.S. in April nineteen eighty one. The car did not live up to John's promises. Okay. It was not groundbreakingly safe or as fuel efficient as he said it would be. Well, he hasn't put in the time traveling device yet. Um, I don't, Give him time. I don't know what the time traveling device is. It's the flux capacitor. I don't know. It, it, you know it's the only way to get 1.21 gigawatts without a bolt of lightning. Do you seriously know this? Dude, that movie raised me. Okay. Come on. Um, so there it is, obviously. It is... Quite a lump of shit, even though I would still love to have one. It looks like a it looks like a bug. Yeah, it like is. A, some, it's got. It looks like it has wings. Like it must have looked old when it came out. People are like, "What year is no, that?" No, that's from? that's how awesome. That's how cars look back then. Like that's like a modern looking so car. So boxy. The doors that's are how cool. They all were. They the were doors all, are cool. I don't care what anyone says. All cars back then like look boxy and lame. And okay, so um, although you probably couldn't park it in like a grocery store parking lot. Why? Because the doors, right? No, the doors just go straight out. Oh, they do? Yeah. Okay. They don't come out sideways. Like. Oh, okay. I can um, it also doesn't have much power, and it doesn't handle very well. Okay, so a lot of good things. A viewer in Cle at a Cleveland auto show got in to the DeLorean and then got trapped for over an hour because the doors wouldn't open. Yeah, still, he's like, better than being outside Cleveland. That's <laughs> right. Um, there is a flaw that really hurt battery life. Um, <laughs> Jesus. Johnny Carson's car died right after he drove it off the lot. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I might be Sammy Davis. And for all this, the price is the same as luxury cars because it costs so much to make. Right. This, it's the exact same price as a, as a, a decent Porsche. Okay. Um, they sell okay. In the UK, the secretary he hired to deal with the government started to sour on John and think that things weren't right. Hmm. In the middle of the night, she filled up two bags of office documents and skipped out. The documents painted the picture of a company mismanaging the British government's money. One memo accused an exec of spending thousands at Harrods on gold-plated faucets. Jesus. So that's some not, Ben Carson shit. That's not good. But it's also very, like dot-com boom shit like that's totally what people were doing in the dot-com boom right. era the plan was to take the car company public so that's okay. in those documents this would have made john 120 million and leave people with stock options like execs and dealers with close to nothing i don't know how this shit works i don't but either basically but, right yeah it's it's like uh you know replacing a glass of tap water with blood that's right right the British government would lose the seats it had on the board, which meant it would not be able to watch what was happening with the, the money. Britain would get 3.6 of the company and 8.4 million for a $150 million investment. So the secretary took the docks to a Tory MP in London, but nothing happened. Cool. Sounds like the Tories. 
<laughs> the secretary waited for weeks. And then finally she talked to a reporter. And the reporter began investigating. But the news of the world killed the story. Hmm. What year? Uh, it's 81, I think. Okay. Um, the reason the news of the world killed the story was because Rupert Murdoch ordered them to. Oh, wow. It turns out Rupert lives in the same building as the DeLoreans. Oh, God. Rupert said he didn't know John, though. He sometimes saw Christina in the elevator. So the reporter sold the story to the Daily Mirror instead. He's like the Forrest Gump of evil. <laughs> right? <laughs> I would love to. I would love to run a simulation where you see what the planet is like if Rupert uh, Murdoch died when he uh, was fifteen. Uh. Oh man, imagine! Oh. Uh, we'd um, probably all be shirtless. <laughs> um. So he sells the story to the Daily Reporter, and Rupert, the guy, Rupert, the guy who didn't know John DeLorean, uh, then immediately gave John the name of a really tough libel lawyer. Which is weird for a guy you don't know, but whatever. Yeah, it whatever. Yeah, it's just being neighborly. It's like a cup of sugar in that building. John started working his press connections. He attacked the secretary, the reporter, and anyone else who was saying anything. The press wrote what he wanted. That's right. The press loves him. Right. He said he would sue the reporter in the Daily Mirror for $250 million. <laughs> Thatcher cuts off any more funds. No, you're done. You're cut off. Just like all the coal miners in Scotland. You're not having any more. You don't get any, you, you eat your meat. <laughs> eat your if you don't get any pudding, you can't eat your meat. No. No, that's not the song. It's something like that. No, that Ed part was not it at all. You can't. Moo, moo. Moo. No, what is that? It's the sound I want the ambulances to make in the streets. I'll voice them. If there's an emergency, it'll just go, moo, no, this, this moo. Is bad. This is bad. This is not. Murd. It's me, Mags. Hello. Mm. Scotland Yard investigated. Look at my quaff. I'm like Queen Victoria, but worse. Scotland Yard investigated and found nothing. What is going on? But the damage was done. The stock offering had been delayed. John was everything on the up and up. I mean, no. Okay. The stock offering was delayed. John's dream of making 120 million is gone. I mean, he is making cars. The factory is sure, functioning. Sure, right. Um, the company is now out of money. On February 19th, 1982, DeLorean Motor Cars was put into receivership. Mm, which means that it's time for them to talk to the people who you can finish who will <laughs> at some point it was still functioning while the government figured out if any part of the business could be salvaged so they're okay. still making cars but they're it's just it's the government's good. in charge right. basically um and and they're trying to figure out what the fuck to do right um the government brought in an expert whose nickname was the undertaker oh good 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 John talked to the New York Times and said he was, quote, delighted by the news. We came out largely unscathed. The government has the problem, and we have the fun end of the business. I trust the undertaker. John said it was going to wipe $130 million off the company books. The undertaker said that was, quote, cod swallop. Oh, yes. <laughs> Finally. Someone, yes. Cod swallop. <laughs> that should be our spinoff podcast. <laughs> Cod swallop. That's bloody cod swallop. Uh, um, so obviously this is huge news all over the place. Right. And a man named James Hoffman was paying attention. Hoffman was a federal informant who'd gotten about $32,000 in salary from the feds to make cases against cocaine dealers. Okay. He was now watching the news and seeing John DeLorean, DeLorean squirm. And he used to know John. Uh, he had lived near John's ranch in California. Okay. One day Hoffman said to his DA escort that he was going to deliver them John DeLorean. The agent didn't believe him. Hoffman got mad and just kept telling the agent he would deliver John DeLorean. Over the next month, the undertaker kept trying to set deadlines and John delayed him by saying he had found an investor. Uh-huh. And it was always for the same amount, $30 million. 
At one point, the undertaker said, quote, Surely to God you could find the grace to vary the figure every now and then, if only for appearance's sake. <laughs> I mean, Don't gonna, fuck with the Undertaker. If you're going to lie to me, at least try to lie to me. <laughs> John went to Sonia and gave her more money. She said to keep the faith. So he knew it would be fine. Sure. Yeah. Because that psychic in Miami said so. John was now doing drugs. What? He was taking uh, Senecal to sleep and a painkiller that was only legal in Canada. Sure. <laughs> yeah. There's no problems there. He kept calling investors, trying to get someone to bite. Then on June 29th, John got a call from James Hoffman. Okay. He offered to hook John up with investors. Hoffman later said they were good friends, and John said they had only met once in a driveway. <laughs> in a driveway. So the two men met in a Marriott bar in Newport Beach. And after that meeting, the FBI opened a file on John DeLorean. It was called Operation Full Circle and involved actual drug dealers. So... He's now part of Hoffman's web where he's getting all these people convicted of right, and arrested. Okay. And the FBI plan was to get John to buy Coke from a dealer to help finance the car company while at the same time getting the dealer to bring money into the U.S. as a temporary loan for John. So that way they can get the drugs and the money that this guy has. Sure. It's a twofer. It's a twofer. John said he it's wanted... a little entrapment-y. What? Yeah. John said he wanted nothing to do with it and just wanted everything to end. Oh, no. Are you going to make him sympathetic? Uh, John said Hoffman then called and threatened to kill his daughter. Quote, I'll send your baby daughter's head home in a shopping bag. Where's the bag from? Yeah, is it paper? Is it, I guess they don't have plastic then. Okay, I mean, yeah. So it's a paper it's bag. It's like a nice Macy's bag. So if it's bag a paper bag, you got to wrap it in, yeah. in some kind of... Some tissue paper. Gauze, tissue paper of, yeah, to yeah. soak up the exactly, blood. Exactly, right. Um... That's a cool I would call. do like a zoo I would do like a zoo bars. I don't you even know, like know what zoo bars of, is, oh, but like, I'll do it. Yeah, I mean or you, I mean you could just do it like a normal grocery store. I'd love an Albertsons one. Yeah. I mean that'd be One fun. of the classy ones though classy, that you reuse. They have the handles. Yeah. yeah. Yep, I'm with you. Oh, head. Um so the problem with this story that John says is that the deal took a long time to close and so these guys are meeting for weeks and months after the call where he threatened to cut off John's daughter's head. Right. And John hung out with them and they're friendly the whole time. Okay. So that's dicey. Yeah. Uh, the entire summer, John met with Hoffman and the drug dealer over and over and over. They began referring to cocaine as monkeys. Sure. Well, that's a good cover. <laughs> Let's snort a line of monkeys. Do we, that still tracks. <laughs> the conversations were all taped. Every By Hoffman. One. No, by the FBI. The oh. FBI is like in the other room. Oh, while wow. Every fucking, every meeting. Jesus. The FBI, it's all in hotel rooms. The FBI is in the other room. There were so many FBI agents in the next room that one time their cigarette smoke set off a fire alarm. Oh, my God. Also, just too much smoke. I know. This is the worst part of the story. Ugh. Just somebody crack a fucking window. Oh, my God. An FBI agent posing as a banker was brought in to help seal the deal. He tried to convince the dealer to take stock or a seat on the board of DeLorean. But the dealer had read all about the car company. <laughs> even the dealer's like, I don't He's make like, shady I don't investments. Know, is that even a thing anymore? I'm trying to keep my portfolio on the up and up. I don't like the Undertaker. Yeah. Another issue was that John needed $1.8 million to buy the Coke. Okay. That's how much the Coke is. But he has no money. Now, does he want the Coke to use or he wants the Coke to take the Coke and sell, sell it on it. the street and have more money? Jesus Christ. It's all a good idea. But he has no money. So he told the banker that he has no money and he blamed the IRA. He's like, look, the IRA is. Really I cut down a fairy me. tree. They've really <laughs> just fleeced me. Even though John had no money, somehow the drug deal moved forward. That's the best way. Oh, great. I still get the drugs. The banker FBI guy offered to loan. John the money to buy the Coke as collateral. John, so he's offering for the, so the drug dealer who is selling the drugs to John, the banker is now working it out where he will give a loan. The drug dealer will give a loan to John and as collateral, John it gives him what's left of DeLorean car parts office shit. Jesus Christ. So the guy buying the drugs is getting a loan to buy the drug. This is what happened with Manchester United when they got bought. Uh, 
and the and the Dodgers. Like right. you buy it, you just get loans and buy a team. So, but this is cocaine. Right, it's different. <laughs> so John pushed the dealer to invest in his car company after the coke was resold to rescue him from foreclosure. Okay, Jesus. In return, John would turn over controlling interest in the DeLorean car company. <laughs> what? Somehow everyone agreed. What? Yeah, none of it makes it does I mean, not it's remotely spe- like especially if you're like I'm building the comeback for the DeLorean. Do you want to run it though until then? <laughs> I mean, literally, there's no reason for John DeLorean to be involved in this. Right, right, yeah. Because the guy's giving him money, and then he's buying cocaine with that money, and then yeah, yeah, he's gonna Walter White a comeback of DeLorean. <laughs> Uh, so it did not dawn on John that he had really nothing to offer anyone in the deal. But I made it. But John was not handing over the DeLorean Motor Cars Unlimited. Instead, he was giving up a dormant shell company with no value that was controlled by British receivers. John told the receivers money was coming into the accounts. Okay. So the night before the deal, John wrote a letter to his lawyer and gave it to someone to open. Oh, by the way, the deal, he called them up and he said, okay, I'm ready to do the monkeys. Let's do monkeys. The night before the deal, John wrote a letter to his lawyer and gave it to someone to open if he died. Oh, wow. It's, it started, quote, I'm going to L.A. tomorrow to accomplish a minor miracle. I will have induced organized crime to donate $10 million to reopen the Belfast plant, and when they figure it out, they cannot do anything about it. Okay. Except kill him. Sure. I don't know why that's not part of his equation, but... Right. As John flew from New York to L.A., the deadline to deliver the money and save his company passed. So he's literally flying in the air when the deadline that the British have set comes and goes... Okay. And no money, that money he thought was coming, the time it did not come. Okay, so that's a stressful flight. So no money is deposited. Okay. He lands. He basically has nothing now. He doesn't know that, though, because it's 80, whatever, 182. Right, right, He has yeah. no phone. He can't right. check no, his bank account. No, he's got pockets he, full of hot women. Yeah, he has to go to his bank account. He can't because he's also with the two guys he's doing the deal. It's, yeah. So they go to a hotel room on Century Boulevard. The banker takes out a suitcase of cocaine. Hoffman said it will make John at least four and a half million after it's resold. John lifts up a bag of cocaine, laughs, and says, it's better than gold. That's Is that for like the next Christmas DeLorean? They're just yeah, going to make it out of cocaine? it's better than gold. It's made out of cocaine. Three people bought it. Then an FBI agent walks in the room and says, hi, John. This is all on camera. Uh, he's arrested on eight felonies. $5 million bail. While he's in jail, he finds God. Oh, Jesus. He was two cells down. He... <laughs> I, fi- I'm, I met him in the shower. Hey, what's up? I'm God. Me and God had a weird thing. Yeah. Uh, he's a top. Yeah. Um, so he ends up selling assets to make bail, including his part of the New York Yankees. Okay. He spent... Uh, that Christmas in Vail. The follow- you, sorry, jail? Vail. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Different. The following summer, Christina and John were baptized in the pool behind his New Jersey mansion. Oh, my God. That's the best place in New Jersey to be baptized. In our pool. I mean, that fall, someone at one of his defense law firms leaked the surveillance tape of the bust to Larry Flint. Oh, shit. <laughs> Jesus. There's a lot of names. There's a lot of players. <laughs> so Larry Flint gave it to 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes aired it on October 23rd, 1983. So now everyone in the country sees John DeLorean. Buying cocaine. Buying cocaine. Calling it gold. Calling it gold. It's fucking devastating. Um, but then because everyone saw it, the trial was delayed because they didn't know how they could get a jury. Right. Um, Larry Flint held a press conference at his mansion. Sure. He played a tape on a boombox and said it was Hoffman threatening to kill John's daughter. Oh, what? But this sounds very bad. Thankfully, Larry had transcripts of the conversation, which he hands out to the reporters. So then Flint gets called into court, and he refuses to tell the judge who made the tape or who gave it to him or to even turn over the tape. So the judge 
gives him a little time to think it over. Uh huh. So when Flint comes back to court, he is dressed in a bulletproof vest, a military helmet, wearing a purple heart, and an American flag as a diaper. <laughs> oh my God! What? How do I not know this part? What? <laughs> oh my God! He had 10,000 in crumpled up bills to pay his contempt of court fine. Oh, my God. And American then, flag as a diaper is uh, quite a statement. So the judge ordered Larry to go down the hall and count the money in a room and straighten it out. Okay. Uh, later, an FBI agent went in and found Larry sleeping on the floor in the room. <laughs> what are these, six? <laughs> Larry Flint ended up pleading guilty to wearing an unauthorized purple heart in exchange for dropping the charges of desecrating the flag. Oh, my God. What a compromise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to have to plead on the uh, flag diaper, but uh, don't worry about the other charges. So do I get away with making a boom boom on the flag? Yeah, you are. In legal terms, you are going to be vindicated from your boom boom. Oh, thank you. Uh, so then Larry admits the tape is a forgery. Okay. John's trial started on March 5th, 1984. The defense said all the tapes were produced and choreographed to make John look guilty. They attacked Hoffman as a paid informant. Even the judge questioned Hoffman, and Hoffman admitted he would get a percentage of the value of the bus. If the judge is cross-examining you, you good. are shady. <laughs> um, the banker FBI agent admitted John was putting up no money for the cocaine. Uh, a DEA, DEA agent testified that Hoffman had made this all happen, and then he cried on the stand when it was revealed the government had ordered his mentor to testify and just try to discredit him. Wow. Christina sat behind John in support every day. Once the judge admonished her for mouthing swear words at witnesses. <laughs> that's, that's how you do it. That's how you do it in a courtroom. Um, the defense's closing argument was so good, it ended up in a book called Greatest Closing Arguments in Modern Law. Whoa. They found John not guilty. John shouted, quote, praise the Lord. Christina left John three weeks after the trial ended. Oh, my God. What? Jesus. So she was rooting for jail. She was like, go to jail. Yeah, go Please to jail. Go to good jail. Lord, go to jail. The dealer in the hotel room with DeLorean flipped on everyone and helped take down Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel. Holy shit. A year later, John was indicted in Detroit on fraud and racking tearing because of all that money that had disappeared from investors at the very beginning. Right. He was found not guilty on all 15 counts. In 1985, Back to the Future was made. The DeLorean appears in the movie as a car that can travel through time. The movie was incredibly successful, and so the car is now more associated with Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fox than John DeLorean. Uh, John declared bankruptcy in 1999. His New Jersey estate was bought by a group who then sold it to Donald Trump, who turned it into a golf course. Mm. Uh, his daughter, Ivanka, was married there. Oh, my God. John kept talking about making another car. He created a watch line called DeLorean Time. They were motion powered and cost $3,495. Well, I mean, and you never see someone without one of those now. <laughs> That's right. Imagine the world without the DeLorean Time. <laughs> <laughs> the motion activated watch. Each purchase included getting on the waiting list for his new car. <laughs> so the watches were never manufactured. Oh, John died soon after of a stroke on March 19th, 2005. He had been living in a New Jersey condo on social security for a decade. Wow. GM declared bankruptcy in 2009. It was the fourth largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. In 2018, GM announced it was laying off or transferring 14,000 workers and 25% of executive staff. Holy shit. So that's a normal story. I mean, I really thought I knew some of that. I knew he got in trouble. I knew he made the DeLorean. Obviously. Everyone, I assumed, I th and I, and I assumed that he had gone to jail. Yeah, I thought he'd gone to jail. He didn't. It was totally. Because he just falls off the map. It was totally obviously entrapment. Um, I mean, yeah. So it's total. I mean, it's entrapment on like a few different levels. Yeah, it too. was a fucking disaster. Um, you know, the thing he probably did, reading through stuff, it sounds like he defrauded people and he got away with that. Yeah. Because that a lot of that money, like he ended up buying a, like some sort of snow clearing company with like millions of it. Like, 
shady as fuck right. with like the movement of money. Um, but he got away with it. Wow. That is a wild little tale you've got there, David. I have I have tons of wild little tales. Shut up. I'm a Don't wild be that tale. Guy. They call me wild tail guy down at the club. <laughs> what club? The club or the history club. Yeah, idiot. I uh, am part of a history country club. Hey, we should mention we signed DeLoreans. <laughs> Happy Easter. Yeah, we love you, Jesus. <laughs>